Well, welcome to another RD Works Learning Lab. Today's session, I hope, is going to be the conclusion um, of the striation marks that you get along the edge of acrylic when you cut it. It's a continuation from the previous session, but this time um, I want to give you visible proof of what is going on. What I've got here is my little 50 quid Chinese, what I call no pro camera. It's an action man camera. Well, I'm certainly no action man, but in this particular instance, I bought it because it was cheap and it's supposedly capable of taking video at 200 frames a second. Now that's as close as I can get to high speed video at a price that I can reasonably afford. Um, 200 frames a second should be good enough by the time we slow it down to see what is going on. We shall have to see. The only problem is I need to take a picture just here. Now here we've got a piece of acrylic, clear acrylic, five millimeters thick and what I want to do is to run the head across there at a steady speed and take a picture on that edge there as the cutter is passing in front of the camera. So basically I would like to put the camera about there somewhere like that so that we can see what's going on. The only problem is this is a wide angle lens on here and it's not designed for macro photography. So I've been a little creative. I thought, for, I thought first of all that maybe I'd be able to show you what was going on closer by putting that in front of the lens. Um, sort of, but not very good. Um, I also get still got quite a lot of wide angle distortion barreling. Something from my past a long time ago, a lens. Now you might say that's not a lens, that's a crystal ball. Well okay, it's a part of a crystal ball. That will help me probably to see into this problem. I've cut myself a, a sort of a little adapter plate that fits on the front of the camera and allows me to strap this on the camera like that. There we are. Now that's a bit of a bodge job but hey at the end of the day if it does the job that's all I need to do. I mean it didn't cost me anything and now I've got an anti-barreling close-up lens and what we really ought to do is just see how it works. So with my camera in place and I've got to set it so that the lens is virtually right on the material and I can't see what the camera is doing because I have to use my um, my mobile phone to see what's happening on the camera so I've got to connect it up to Wi-Fi and there we go 480p 200 frames a second that's the setting that I've got it on and then what I've got to do is I'll turn my machine on I have to decide on what airflow I want just a whisper like that I can just hear it against that edge and then I'll set my speed to 10 millimeters a second and then we should do a manual pass I haven't got the um, haven't got the extraction on purposely so that we've got smoke in the background so we can see what real time is. Now if there's any hint that the smoke is actually jumping you'll know that the frames are not being uniformly joined together. In other words I'm seeing a jumpy video. So I need something real and live to, to assure myself that the video that I'm watching is actually real time. And that's what we're planning to do. Okay, now with the magic of my editing system, we'll slow things down to a crawl so that we can have a little bit of a careful look and a chat. Now, two things I want you to look at. Number one, I want you to just keep an eye on the smoke so that you can see that it is like real time. It's moving, it's not jumping. And that means you can also look at the movement of the head, the nozzle as well, as that tracks across the screen to see if you can detect any change in velocity. And that may well answer one or two other questions that we have. Um, but after you've looked at that, start coming back and looking at that. Um, it looks a bit like a, a twister. Um, it's doing some funny things, but you will notice, particularly at the bottom, how the front, the burn front, is moving in little jumps. It's also doing it at the top and as you start getting off to the side of the picture here you'll see that it becomes a lot more evident how that front is moving forward in a non-linear manner. It's
taking little minute steps, sometimes quite big steps. And you can see that there's no air assist on that at all, hardly. The smoke is not coming out. Now, here we've got doubling of the speed to 20 millimeters a second with no change of anything else. Um, the air assist is still just a whisper. And I want you to look carefully at the bottom of the plume and the way in which it's sort of uh, randomly flicking around. Just occasionally you'll see a lot sort of a white flash in the bottom there, but just see what it's doing. It's almost like ploughing a field. It's doing some really strange things at the bottom there. Well, here we are again, just doing a whisper. Um, and you can clearly see that the smoke as it comes out the bottom, I'll say smoke fumes that are coming out the bottom because they're basically um, vaporized acrylic. They're the fumes that are coming out of there. And you can see the bottom of the beam does dance around quite a lot. It drags and then it moves forward and it drags and then it moves forward. And then you start casting your eye towards the top. And in fact, what you can see in that plume, what you can see in that leading burn front there is basically vapor, which looks as though it's forming. And I'm wondering whether this hot vapor is sort of producing a little whirlwind effect, which is the thing that's actually causing these striations because there's no obvious jumping forward, but you can see that it is leaving marks behind. And you can see the column filling up and emptying and filling up and emptying with fumes. I mean, you'll need to watch this several times to just draw your own conclusions from what you're seeing. And now what we've done, we've pumped the air assist right up to full bore. Now, if you look carefully at about 45 degrees or 30 or 40 degrees back from the cut, you can see there's a high speed jet coming out of there. It isn't coming out the bottom of the cut as you would expect. It's coming out backwards at sort of like about 30 degrees. Now that's a bit strange and puzzling. because that's a bit counterintuitive. And again, you can see how the bottom of the beam, where the energy is a little bit less, is dragging, but it is making it all the way through the cut. But you can see very clearly now that jet as it comes out the bottom surface. So this is with full air assist on. And then here we are, full air assist again, but this time we've upped the speed to 20 millimeters a second, so it's not going to cut through. But again, now I want you to look at the little white puffs that are occurring down at the actual bottom of the slot there. It's very turbulent down there, and you can see like the, the fumes are penetrating deeper and shallower and deeper and shallower and it's really quite an interesting pretty effect but no good for the surface finish of course well as I mentioned to you in the previous session um, my background in metal cutting laces gave me a possible clue as to what the striation marks were when we cut acrylic. I'm just going to point you to this document here, which is a PDF document that you can download for yourself off the interweb. It's uh, quite heavy reading, but once we get beyond page one, what we should find there is, first of all, these are typical of the striations that you'll see on steel. There's some really strange patterns. They get a lot worse than this. But here we've got a little demonstration of the picture that I tried to draw for you last time, the actual mechanism of melt removal and I think this same mechanism can be interpolated across 
to account for the striations that we see in acrylic. Now all the reference you need is up the top there on the left hand corner and I will um, I'll leave you to pick this document up and read it if you want. I think we've done a fairly moderate job of getting some reasonable pictures. They're certainly not gallery quality pictures but hey we're interested in the information that it contains. With a 50 quid camera can I expect more? I think we should be able to deduce quite a lot from these pictures um, especially when I start looking at the surface detail of what we've produced. So these are the two surface finishes produced by a through cut both done at 10 millimeters a second the top one was done with full air and the bottom one was done with a whisper okay now to be honest this picture is um, not quite as good as I'd hoped uh, the picture itself is nothing wrong with it but I found it difficult to light it in such a way that I could give you sufficient information about the surface finish now you can just about detect um, slightly more roughness on the top picture the bottom one is smoother and in fact when you when you finger scratch them and look at the surface in a different sort of light it becomes apparent that the one with less air in other words the whisper has got a a better surface finish I wouldn't say it's perfect I've had very good burnished surface finishes and this is not one of them but it is better than the one with full air assist. All I can say is yes it's a great picture of the striations and it does absolutely nothing to prove my point. Now this next pair are actually very very telling. The one on the top was done with full air assist and the one on the bottom was done with a whisper. Both of those pieces of material are five millimeters thick. The depth of cut that we can see there is about the same for both. I was expecting probably with full air assist that it might be slightly shallower and if I look at the tops of those peaks maybe it is slightly shallower. But the bottom one with its rounded peaks is very interesting. I mean they're both interesting pictures but the one at the bottom is very very telling. Now this is quite an amazing picture. Let me just describe what it is to start with. First of all this was a closed cut and what I did was to break open the cut so that what you're seeing at the bottom of that picture is basically a cross section of the piece of material that wasn't cut but cut into that very deep furrows is where the laser beam has penetrated and produced some serious little wormholes. So this is a fascinating picture because actually it tells me a great deal about the movement of the laser beam itself. As I've mentioned before acrylic is a fantastic material for telling you the power density of the beam that hits it because it only disappears and evaporates proportional to the energy that's hitting it. So where you see these round shapes for instance where they go up it means the laser beam is moving across from left to right in a faster manner because the beam is constant power all the way. When the material at the bottom of the picture becomes taller it means the beam is moving faster. That doesn't mean to say that the head is moving faster and slower. I'm just talking about the beam itself. Now with the aid of this picture what I'm trying to describe to you here is coming in from the left hand side we've got a laser beam red. Okay now you can see that the laser beam itself is quite narrow as it hits the acrylic it turns the acrylic into a gas plume. Now that gas plume is not limited to the width of the laser beam itself. It has a sphere of influence around it and it basically creates a wider groove than the beam itself and so consequently the green is actually tried to be a description of the, the little gas explosion that takes place around the beam. In other words it, it, it's not like a drill where it drills a hole 
this is a completely different set of gas dynamics and so consequently what happens is you've got this area where the material has been eroded away in front of the beam and around the side of the beam but the beam continues on at a steady speed until it breaks out of the area where it's already excavated and it then hits fresh material and then it does the same thing again and let's now move on and we'll give you an animation of that effect. Now as this animation proceeds you can see how the overlapping green areas produce little nibbles along the side and it is those nibbles that are actually the striations. My little green overlapping circles shows lovely clean little nibbles and striations. Sadly the picture is a little bit more complex than that. What I've tried to do here in this picture is blue line across the bottom which is a surface. If you take the top of the picture and push it away from you onto that blue surface at the bottom. So you'll then finish up with material between the two blue lines and above that wavy blue line is actually fresh air. That blue line is actually a replication of that surface at the back there that you can see. I want you to note that that surface is also a replication of the pattern that's in the bottom of the groove. I mean it is a lovely pattern on the surface which is when you look at it closely a double ripple but it's a double ripple that is got a cyclic nature to it it keeps repeating itself. Now I doubt very many of you guys will have ever bothered to look at this you just see the pattern on the edge of your acrylic and think that's a bloody nuisance how can I get rid of it? The answer is I don't think you can. Having studied now the way in which this whole system works I think the best that you can do less air less speed allow more heat to stay in the job to allow these peaks to sort of smooth themselves off a little bit. In other words the the material is soft and if you apply too much gas to it it will quickly harden these peaks off and freeze them. But if you leave them soft uh, they tend to meld into each other and produce a more of a glazed surface. There is still imperfections on the surface but can be pretty good finish if you get the speed and the, and the airflow just right. So I think this picture, which was done with maximum air assist, confirms that point. Everything in this picture is crisp because of the high airflow and the rapid cooling of any surface imperfections that are caused by the beam. If you look at the bottom, you'll see that they're no longer little rounded fingers that point up. They're mountains, crisp, sharp mountains. And this particular picture was taken with the beam running from right to left you can clearly see the drag on the beam at the bottom and the way that that shape of the drag matches perfectly the right hand side of the mountains. Because of the cooling effect of the extra gas flow I was expecting the depth of cut to be slightly less. To be honest there was not the difference that I was expecting to see. But it's still a very interesting picture because it just confirms all the facts that we've just been talking about but in a more exaggerated way. Where well, there are still a couple of questions to ask. The first one is does speed have an effect on these striations? Are they speed dependent? Well take a look at the pictures above and see if you can tell me which one was done at 10 millimeters a second and which one was done at 20 millimeters a second. Yeah, there is a clue in the picture and that's the bottom picture which wasn't cut through so therefore that was done at 20 millimeters a second but I think you'll see that there's nothing obvious there that tells you that speed is a factor that will help to resolve this situation. What about the bottom of the cut? I can't imagine any mechanism that we can use changing the gas flow, changing the temperature. You might be able to change the speed to run fast enough to sort of just gloss over the surface a little bit. I haven't tried that but from the video that you've just seen I did try it and here's what we found. The cut was about three quarters of a millimetre deep. It was basically a very shallow cut but we're looking down into the cut here 
and yeah there is a small amount of roughness on the bottom surface now I wouldn't call it roughness it's more like undulation I thought I was going to have difficulty breaking open the piece of acrylic so that we could see a cross section so the bulk of this picture is the broken cross section but at the top there is about half to three quarters of millimeters of cut which is showing virtually no signs of any striation on the walls at all and it's got a lovely smooth bottom mm. that takes me back a few years um anyway back to acrylic so there are possibilities here for maybe improving the surface if i do 3d engraving on acrylic and that would be to possibly do a few fast passes to finish with I suspect that this last finding of a high speed pass may well work for wood as well but whether or not the slow deep passes with the rough bottomed cut are the cause of my marks in 3D wood engraving I've yet to find out so there's another subject that we still haven't closed I think that's probably about all I can say for now so thank you very much for watching hope it hasn't been too boring um, and uh, I'll catch you up on the next session